Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, this is, uh, I don't know, the second or third time uh, that I have visited to do a program for uh, the Mount Prospect Library. So it's always a great pleasure to come out and talk to people. Uh, I'm a professional astronomer and uh, I do a lot of kind of frontline edge research uh, that you hear about all the time. But uh, one of the things that I find very gratifying is the opportunity to come talk to people about things that are very near and dear to my heart. Um, black holes in particular, which we're going to talk about today, um, are something that we hear a lot about in the news. Uh, you hear lots of press releases from NASA, and there's often big results uh, about them, but they are very enigmatic objects. And if you haven't studied them your whole career like I have, or you haven't been in school, uh, you know, recently uh, in the last several decades, then perhaps there's uh, some mystifying things about it that uh, we can answer some questions about tonight. So I have a few slides. I'll go ahead and share those slides with you. Um, I'll chitter chatter at you for a little while for kind of 45 or 50 minutes. Um, and then uh, when we get to the end, um, I'll certainly uh, be able to answer questions for anyone who might have some. Uh, if you are interested, uh, I have a public science blog. So writescience.wordpress.com there, that is my blog. Um, it is aimed at the public. As I tell people, I write it so my mom knows what I do. Uh, but it has a lot of things there about uh, black holes and uh, astronomy and various other topics that uh, I do think about and, and ponder in astronomy. So you may find stuff there that you're interested in. Uh, there's my social media links, in including my YouTube channel, where there's a playlist of other talks that I have given. Okay, so we're going to talk about black holes. Um, and the first place I always like to start uh, in the discussion of black holes is really the question of what is a black hole. Now, a black hole as a phrase and as an astronomical object is something that has very widespread um, awareness of. People have heard this term before. And if I were to go walking out on the street and ask folks uh, what they know about black holes or what is a black hole, by and large, they will get lots of the things about black holes correct. They know the kind of fundamentals. Now, we know the fundamentals of black holes so much that they uh, pervade both uh, literature, uh, science fiction writing, and also movies. And so I was exposed to black holes very early on in my life by this movie, which some of you may have been exposed to black holes as well. Okay, so this is uh, The Black Hole by Disney. Um, there are many scientists who dislike this movie, uh, but I actually think it's a great movie in the context of the black holes, because even though it's not exactly right about black holes, and in reality, very little science fiction is completely right uh, about black holes or almost anything in science, um, it has enough little elements of truth about black holes, enough things that they get right about black holes, or at least close to right, that I find it's a good place to start when we want to talk to people about what are black holes, how do they behave, what's the nature of them, what are the exotic things about them that we think about uh, or that we know about when we think about them in the context of physics and astronomy. OK, so if you haven't seen this movie, uh, you certainly are welcome to watch it. It's a Disney movie. So it's got, you know, killer robots and, you know, science fiction adventure. It is made in the 80s. So the uh, uh, special effects aren't what you're used to if you're used to watching movies from the 2000s. But uh, but nonetheless, some of the stuff about black holes in there, um, I certainly don't mind. But. When I ask this question, what is a black hole? I'm really asking as a scientist, okay? And so we will often, uh, if I were to do this in person, I'd ask you all what you think. We generate a long list, but I would like to posit to you tonight um, a basic definition that defines what I mean when I say black hole. And what I mean when I say a black hole is it's an object whose gravity is so strong not even light can escape, okay? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in context as we go through here. But the black hole has a surface, okay? That surface is called the event horizon. And if you stand on or stand near the event horizon and in fact cross through it, it's just a, a, a surface, it's not solid, okay? It's a boundary. Uh, then that's the point where gravity becomes so strong that even if you were traveling at the speed of light, you could not escape from the black hole. OK, so using that as our fundamental definition, everything that I'm going to tell you tonight follows. OK, 
Now, the second question I often ask people is who thought of this idea? OK, and that's a little bit harder question for people to get right uh, if you're not a student of science. But the first person to think about this and to actually write down the definition of a black hole was the Reverend John Mitchell in 1783. So Mitchell was an Anglican priest, um, and as was true uh, back then, many of the clergy were highly educated people, and Mitchell in particular was trained in mathematics and science. Uh, there is no picture of him that exists, which is why I just have a silhouette of him there. But he is the first person to write down mathematically using the laws of gravity, which Newton had just published barely 100 years before, uh, the idea uh, or the strength of gravity around an object whose gravity was so strong that light could not get away. Now, in those days, they didn't really know how fast the speed of light was. They knew the speed of light was fast, Okay, and it was the fastest thing they knew of, but they hadn't really gotten around to kind of accurately measuring it and agreeing on what the value was. And so for Mitchell, he was really kind of pondering the speed of light as just a reference. He didn't know there was anything special about the speed of light. So he just asked how strong would an, how, what would an object have to be like in terms of its size and mass for the gravity to be that strong? Now, when I ask the question of who first thought of black holes, usually the answer we get is Albert Einstein. And Einstein uh, certainly put general relativity, which is the modern description of gravity that we use in astronomy and physics, on the table. But what Einstein added to this uh, was, was exactly what Mitchell had said, that black holes are objects whose gravity is so strong not even light can escape. But the only thing Einstein really added was that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And so the implication then is that you can never escape from a black hole once you're inside it. And indeed, that's the thing about black holes that we know today that makes them so exotic. And that was the point uh, that Einstein really added. OK? So this is the framework that we're going to discuss black holes in. Now, modern black holes are, uh, uh, are really an area of professional astronomical and, and physics study. Uh, you can get a PhD uh, studying black holes. That's certainly what I did. Go learn about tensor calculus and differential equations and how to simulate things on computers and then spend your career studying these objects. OK, but even though it is really the purview of professional scientific research, the thing I would like to convince you of tonight is that black holes are really simple. OK, and I'm using that word very explicitly here, and you should be squirming in your seats wondering, what does he mean really simple? Right. He just told me you have to have a Ph.D. in tensor calculus and general relativity in order to work on black holes in your everyday life. So how could they possibly be simple? And what I mean by simple is something very specific. OK, so so to to work our way around that, imagine going down to the Mount Prospect Library over to the magazine area and you will find lots of magazines like this magazines about cars. OK. Why do you find magazines about cars? You find magazines about cars because cars are not simple objects. They're in fact very complex objects. And to build something like a Yugo here, you need to describe something like 20,000 individual parts. The tires, the hubcats, the headlights, the hoses, the screws that hold the door handle on, the hinges, the mirrors, the windows, the trim. Every one of those 20,000 parts, you have to describe its shape, its size, where it goes on the car, how it connects to other pieces. All of that stuff has to be specified in order for you to completely describe a car. OK? By contrast, you never see magazines like this, okay? And the reason is, is because black holes are simple. And if I use this same idea that I was using to describe the car here, that to describe a car, you need 20,000 pieces of information, then black holes are simple because in order to describe black holes, you only need three pieces of information. Three numbers, if you write them down, you can completely understand everything there is to understand about a given black hole. And those three numbers are the mass, how much stuff the black hole has, 
There is the spin. How fast is the black hole rotating? Okay, and then the electric charge, right? The stuff you get out of the socket in your wall. You know, that sort of uh, charge can embed itself on objects. And if a black hole has some, it affects how it behaves. Okay, so if I tell you those three numbers, I have completely described a black hole. I can date those three numbers, I can drop them into the laws of gravity, and I can predict everything you need to know about black holes. In fact, the things that I'm going to tell you tonight about black holes all come from knowing what those three numbers are. Okay, so let's talk about some of this. Okay, the first thing is black holes, as I said a moment ago, are not solid objects. They're not like stars or planets or Lego bricks or rocks or anything that you may encounter where you can reach out your hand and touch it. There's a surface. Okay, black holes are really not objects in that sense at all. The event horizon, that point where the gravity becomes uh, uh, so strong, um, is, is, just, uh, is just a line in space. And if you cross over it, the gravity gets stronger. And if you stay on this side of it, the gravity gets weaker. Okay, so if a black hole is kind of not solid, there's nothing there except gravity itself, what do I mean when I say something like mass? Right, you and I are used to mass. It's what you read on your bathroom scale when you stand on it every morning, right? But if a black hole isn't solid, what is it that I'm putting on the bathroom scale to measure its mass? The answer to that question isn't really known. And in fact, there's a lot of debate about where the mass in the black hole is. We can leave that conversation for later. It's related to something deep down in the black hole called the singularity, which we don't understand in the context of the laws of physics. But astronomers still are very confident that we can define the mass of a black hole. Okay, And the way we do it is the way we define the mass for everything else in the universe. Okay, So imagine the sun. Okay, the sun has a certain mass. You can look it up, 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Okay, how do we know the mass of the sun? I guarantee you no astronomer has gone out with a bathroom scale and set the sun down on the bathroom scale. But we have a number for the mass. Okay, how did we get that number? Well, the way we get that number is we watch things go around the sun. And we use the laws of gravity to deduce what the mass of the sun is by measuring the orbits. Those orbits may be things like the planets. We can watch the Earth and Mercury and Saturn go around the sun and derive the mass of the sun from that way. Or we may send space probes or spaceships orbiting around the sun, and we can look at their orbits and derive the mass of the sun that way. Okay, so we can absolutely do the same thing with black holes. If I can look out into the universe and I can see some object orbiting around a black hole, if I measured the properties of that orbit, I can deduce the mass of the black hole. Its gravity behaves exactly the same thing as if I had had a mass described by the orbit that I'm looking at right there in the center where the black hole is. In fact, if I were to take the sun and replace it with a black hole that has the same mass as the sun, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference out here on Earth, other than the fact that it would be very dark. Okay, But as far as the Earth's orbit's concerned, it doesn't care that there's a one solar mass star, the sun, or a one solar mass black hole sitting at the center of the solar system. Okay. So this gives us the fundamental way that we measure black holes. And we'll come back to this in a moment, right? We can't actually observe black holes because we observe them. We observe everything in the universe with light at the moment. And so what we're reduced to when we're studying them is looking at things that we can see light behaving in strange ways around black holes. OK, but before we get to that, let's talk about whether or not black holes exist. And in fact, if black holes exist, how nature makes them. OK, so this is a, a part of uh, uh, astronomy that we have been slowly figuring out. We think we have a good understanding now of how this happens, although the exact conditions under which it happens for sure or not um, are, are still not quite certain. We certainly know it happens absolutely in some cases, but the transition from it does to does not happen is the places where we're uncertain. Okay, so the way we make black holes is we blow up stars. 
Okay, so those of you who are astronomy aficionados, this is what we call a supernova. Okay, now we know stars explode. We have seen supernovas in the sky in other galaxies. Uh, we uh, have records of supernovas here in the Milky Way in our own galaxy, although the last recorded supernova in the Milky Way uh, was more than 400 years ago, okay, before the invention of the telescope. But nonetheless, we do see, as we look around the Milky Way galaxy, the remnants of exploded stars, okay, what we call supernova remnants. So those of you who are backyard astronomers, or if you look at the stars when you go out camping, you got to get away from the lights in Chicago. Uh, this summer, uh, when the Milky Way is high in the sky, you'll look straight up and you'll see a constellation called Cygnus the Swan or the Northern Cross. Okay, and right off the wing of Cygnus, okay, there is a supernova remnant. Okay, and this is what it looks like. This is called the Cygnus Loop, okay, or the Cygnus Complex. The part up here is usually called the witch's broom, and the part down here is usually called the veil nebula. So these are the remains of a star that exploded some eight to 10,000 years ago. Okay, The explosion was so enormous that it blew the outer layers of the star out, as well as an enormous amount of material uh, just underneath them, into the universe. And that material is spewing out into the galaxy right now. It is carrying with it all kinds of stuff that was made in the star. And eventually this gas will merge with other gas in the Milky Way, and it will form new stars and new planets. When we say that you and I are made of star stuff, this is what we're talking about. We're made of the remnants of exploded stars. Now, somewhere deep in the center of this though, the skeleton of the star that exploded exists. There are many supernova remnants where we've found those skeletons. We haven't found the one in the um, uh, Cygnus loop, uh, but there are many examples where we have found them, okay? And there are basically two kinds of skeletons that result from this process of exploding a star. Okay, so to talk about those, let's uh, squeeze our attention down to the size of a city. Okay, so here's a, here's a uh, Google map of uh, the lakefront here on the north side of Chicago. And when a star explodes and it throws off all the outer parts of its atmosphere, the skeleton, the core that's left, is a very small remnant, okay, that's about 12 kilometers, uh, 20 kilometers in diameter, 12 miles across, okay? This object is what we call a neutron star. It is almost entirely made of neutrons. It is not a black hole yet. Its gravity is not strong enough to be a black hole, but this object is extreme nonetheless, okay? So if you could walk on the surface of a neutron star, okay, you couldn't, but if you could, the gravity on the surface would be 200 billion times stronger than the gravity you're feeling right now pulling you down into your seat there on the earth, okay? The gravity on these things is enormously strong, but it's still not strong enough to be a black hole. How strong is the gravity? If you were walking across the surface of a neutron star and you could barely walk, but imagine you're a superhero, right? If you could walk across the surface of a neutron star and you had the misfortune of encountering a tiny cliff just one millimeter high, and you fell off that cliff, by the time you fell to the bottom of that cliff, one millimeter below, you would be traveling at 136,000 miles per hour. The gravity on these things is enormous, but it's still not a black hole, okay? This is a graphic we made uh, here at Northwestern for a discovery, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. Uh, showing how that neutron star would look if it was hanging over the city of Chicago, okay? If you could go down to uh, the uh, Willis Tower and go up to the top and, you know, reach up with a spoon and just pull off a little piece of the neutron star the size of a sugar cube, the mass of that sugar cube would weigh three times more than the entire human race, okay? These are the things that stars do when they die. They make extreme stuff. 
but it's still not a black hole. Okay. So what does it take to turn one of these things into a black hole? Well, sometimes the explosion is stronger than the one that makes a neutron star. Okay. The stars are a little bit bigger. They got a little bit mass, uh, a little bit more mass. And so the explosion is stronger. And when that happens, it, it squeezes on the neutron star. It compresses it enormously strong. Okay. So strong that if this thing shrinks down to just three and a half miles across, then it completely vanishes from the universe and leaves behind what you and I call a black hole. Okay. This object has gravity so strong that not even light can escape. Okay. And it doesn't make any sense to talk about a black hole in the way we just talked about a neutron star. There's no surface. There are no cliffs. You can't walk across it. There's no material to grab in a spoon and mass. There's just gravity itself, a shadow in space of the one place where all of the things that were the star used to be. Okay. So this object is a black hole. And we see lots of evidence for these in the universe. In fact, when I first started as a professional astronomer, uh, the idea of black holes was understood and known, but astronomers hadn't really convinced themselves that there were, in fact, black holes at all. Okay. And so over the last 20 years or so, the observational evidence for black holes has increased uh, remarkably. And so I'm going to tell you some of those pieces of evidence now. OK, so it all begins with astronomy. OK, and if astronomers want to find black holes, they want to go out and use their instruments, use their telescopes to look for black holes. And so the question is, what do they look for? What do we point our telescope towards and what are we trying to detect to convince ourselves that a black hole exists? OK, so uh, my wife uh, is at the Adler Planetarium. So I asked her, I was like, Michelle, I'm going to give a talk about black holes to the folks at the Mount Prospect Library. I need a picture to show them of what black holes look like. OK, and she's like, sure, absolutely. I can help you out. All you have to do is give me the image credit. So I'm like, sure, I'll do that, babe. No problem. OK, so this is the picture she gave me. OK, and hopefully you're laughing right now. OK, but this is a very serious picture. OK, this is the problem astronomers have. By definition, a black hole is an object which not even light can escape from. So if I'm an astronomer and I use my telescopes, which collect light to make pictures to look for black holes, then I can't see black holes with my telescope. So what is a poor astronomer to do? Okay, well, what poor astronomers do is they use their telescopes to look at things that do emit light. And what they look for is they look for black holes doing things to the things that do emit light. They look at objects that are behaving in exotic ways, and then we ask, are those exotic behaviors explainable because of the presence of a black hole, okay? And there are many different pathways we go down uh, through this, and there are many examples that we can give you um, of this. And so let me tell you a few of those stories, okay? So uh, for the amateur astronomers, again, uh, spring is coming. And so if you're a uh, backyard observer, uh, spring is galaxy season, as most of us uh, in the amateur astronomy world know. So this area here between the constellation Virgo and the constellation Leo, there is an enormous group of galaxies called the Virgo cluster. There's about 2,000 galaxies in this part of the sky. And right in the center, of the Virgo cluster is one of the largest galaxies known. It's called Virgo A, or M87, for those of you who are uh, aficionados, Messier 87. Okay, and this is a picture of it. Okay, this e e entire glowy, glowy football here in the middle, this is a massive elliptical galaxy. Okay, it's a thousand times bigger than the Milky Way. And it is very enormous. Its gravity dominates the entire Virgo cluster. All of these other fuzzballs you see here are also galaxies in the Virgo cluster. But M87 is the big kid on the block, OK? 
Now, it's been known for a long time that MA7 was big, and astronomers beginning uh, in the 1950s, when we first built the Palomar Telescope, have been peering intently down at the core of, the, um, uh, of Virgo A. And deep down in the core, there is an exotic structure that we have known about. That exotic structure, NASA imaged uh, after the launch of the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can see it right here. It's what we call a jet. It's an enormously long, thin pencil beam of light, thousands of light years long, moving at very high speeds, jetting out from an apparent point at the center of Virgo A. OK, so this is a picture from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. This is a picture that I took okay, with a 16 inch uh, amateur backyard telescope. Okay, I did this with my friend Mike Murray and Adam Block. Uh, as far as we know, this was the very first amateur image taken of, of the jet in M87. But you can see it right there. It looks just like the NASA image. Right. So if you don't uh, if you don't have access to Hubble, you can go do this in your backyard. OK, so what is that jet? OK. Well, what we can simulate on computers and what we can understand from uh, how material is expected to behave around the black hole is if there is a black hole, okay, in this case is a massive black hole, a, a billion times more massive than the sun, the gravity of, the, of that object causes gas and dust in the center of the galaxy to swirl around it, okay? And that material, as it swirls around, it interacts with itself. It gets very hot. It emits light. And as it squeezes down onto the black hole, it has to conserve all of its special properties that it has to conserve in physics. Those of you who remember your physics class, there are things like conservation of energy, conservation of angular momentum, all kinds of different stuff. OK, additionally, there are magnetic fields. There's all kinds of very strange interactions that go on down near the black hole. And some of this material falls into the black hole. It makes the black hole get bigger. It disappears forever. But some of it just can't stop spinning. And when that happens, it squirts out along this jet and it creates that jet that you can see there in the image of M87. OK, so this is the basic idea of where these jets come from. And we see lots and lots of these around the universe. When we look at galaxies all over, uh, we, we, we look down near their cores and we see these jets. Vir Virgo is just one of the closest and most well-known examples. OK, so this is a prime piece of evidence for, uh, for big black holes at the centers of galaxies. Now, this intrigued us a lot, and we've paid a lot of attention to Virgo, uh, to Virgo A, to M87. And over the last 10 years, uh, 10 years or so, maybe a little bit longer, our colleagues have been linking together telescopes around the world to look at the heart of M87 over and over and over and over again. Okay, and some of you may remember a couple of years ago, they released one of the most stunning and remarkable images of the heart of M87. Okay, so this is from our friends at the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. This is the picture they released of, quote unquote, the black hole at the center of M87. Okay, so uh, they've recently seen a second picture of the black hole at the center of our own Milky Way, but this was the first one. Okay, and so what you see is you see this very bright donut of light. Okay, and then in the center, there is a black shadow. OK, and down inside the center of that, right, uh, about two thirds the size or so, something like that, is the black hole. OK, and what you're seeing here is all of that material, all of this material that's around the black hole is getting very hot. It's emitting light. And then the distortions of the light that you see here are because the gravity of the black hole is so strong that outside the black hole, you can still get away from the black hole. Inside the black hole, you can't. But outside the black hole, the gravity is so strong, it can bend the pathways the light travels along. Okay, so it's kind of like looking at a funhouse mirror in a carnival or at, at a, a fair, okay? The light is trying to go off in one direction, but the gravity of the black hole is bending it and sending it our direction, giving us this highly distorted donut-shaped picture that you see right here, okay? So this, uh, together with the companion picture uh, of the Milky Way, this is the one of the best pieces of observational uh, astronomy ever done on these big black holes. 
okay? And all of you lived through it here in just the last few years. Okay, so this is big black holes, but what about smaller black holes, right? If we want to see smaller black holes or, or, see, or, or see things besides this kind of, you know, uh, uh, donut-y pictures of it, we need to understand what happens to objects that you and I are familiar with when they get close to a black hole. OK, so let's let's explore that question and then we'll show you some uh, some some other uh, astrophysical evidence. OK, so if we're going to ask what happens when you get too close to a black hole, you have to have something to drop into the black hole, something that you can look at and understand in the context of of how it how it should behave and then look at how the black hole's gravity changes it. OK, so I propose we drop some explorers in. These are the two explorers that I would like to uh, drop in. OK, uh, we made a mistake this Halloween. We realized that this really should have been Starfleet Ernie here instead of just Starfleet person. But that's OK. These will be our two explorers that we drop into a black hole. OK, so what happens if these explorers jump into a black hole? If they get really, really super close to a black hole. OK, they're solid objects, just like a starship or an asteroid or a star or a planet would be. And so we can ask what happens to them as they get close to a black hole. So the point about black holes is that gravity depends, the strength of gravity depends on how far you are away from the black hole. That's true of all objects. It's just the gravity around the black hole is more extreme than the gravity around other objects. Okay, But the point is, is that if you're close to the black hole, gravity pulls on you more strongly. And if you're far from the black hole, gravity pulls on you more weakly. Okay, So I've represented that in this picture by these arrows. Okay, if it's a big arrow, the gravity is really strong. And if it's a little arrow, the gravity is really weak. Okay, and so if you compare this to our friend Bert here, what happens is if Bert jumps in feet first, the black hole pulls very strongly on Bert's feet. It's also pulling on Bert's head, but it's pulling on Bert's head much more uh, weakly than it's pulling on the feet. And so the, uh, the uh, effect of the black hole is to try and elongate Bert, to pull Bert apart into a very long, thin strand. Okay, and we have a technical word for that, thanks to Stephen Hawking. That's called spaghettification. Okay, you can look it up on Wikipedia. He used it in a brief history of time for those of you who have read the book. Okay, the spaghettification is this idea that you're pulling more strongly on one side of you than the other, and the net result is to stretch you out. Okay, so if uh, technical language and technical physics language, that's called a tidal deformation. So if you want to go impress your kids or your mom with what you learned at uh, uh, astronomy talk tonight, you learned about tidal deformation. Okay, but generally we still call this spaghettification. Okay, now it happens to all objects. And so the smaller an object is, the more extreme the spaghettification is, the more compact the object is, it will change your length along the axis. And you can see the captain getting stretched here very, very dramatically. Now that sounds exotic, but nonetheless, if we threw something else at a black hole, not explorers, but say a star, the star will in fact be torn apart. This is a uh, simulation based on observations of a gas cloud that fell into our own Milky Way black hole uh, in the early 2000s. And uh, I'll let the movie loop. You'll see it there. But it starts out as a very compact little blob of material. And then as it gets close to the black hole, the parts of it that are close to the black hole get pulled into the black hole. And the parts that are far from the black hole keep uh, they're getting pulled in, as you can see there, very slowly. But see, it elongates out, okay? And then it keeps pulling in and stuff keeps going, but all of it eventually is going to fall into the black hole, okay? So this is a star being spaghettified by the black hole at the center of our galaxy, okay? Now, that sounds exotic, but it actually happens in ordinary situations as well. Probably the most famous example is here in uh, our own solar system. Some of you may remember this. Uh, in 1992, there was a comet that passed very close to Jupiter, not too close to a black hole, to Jupiter. And Jupiter's gravity was so strong that it spaghettified this comet. 
The parts of the comet that were close to Jupiter got pulled on more strongly than the parts that were far from Jupiter, and it broke the comet apart into this long string of 29 pieces or so, which eventually impacted on Jupiter. OK, and so uh, those of us in amateur astronomy, we could watch this happen in real time. And then there were these kind of black marks on Jupiter from where the comet had impacted it. OK, so this is a real life example of spaghettification happening right here in our own solar system without black holes. OK, so this is not exotic behavior. It just is more extreme in the case of black holes. OK. Now. The closest black hole to Earth is actually also in that constellation Cygnus I told you about. So if you look at the Northern Cross this summer, right in the center of Cygnus, right in the neck of the swan, you'll see a bright star. And right next to that bright star is a star that you can see in your telescope. Uh, but it's also an X-ray source, meaning that astronomers can see that star using their X-ray telescopes. The star is about 5,900 light years away, and it's the closest black hole candidate to Earth, or it traditionally has been. There's one that's now closer that we're working to confirm right now. OK, so what is Cygnus X1? It's a blue star that you can see in your telescope. But if we watch that star on a time scale of about five and a half days, we see that star wobble. It rocks back and forth in the sky because it's orbiting something that we can't see, okay? When we look at that star in X-rays, we see enormously bright X-rays. And the reason there are enormously bright X-rays is because material from the star is being sucked on to its companion, which we can't see. It's presumably a black hole, okay? And as that material falls towards the black hole, it rubs against the other stuff falling towards it. It starts moving very fast. It gets very hot. And when it gets very hot, it emits x-rays. OK, so this is the source of the x-rays. And based on the x-ray flux, based on the uh, wobbling of the star, we can mass measure the weight of this black hole. And we think this black hole is about 20 times the mass of our sun. OK? So this is the closest black hole candidate to Earth. And this black hole is its intense gravity is affecting its companion star. It's sucking material and wind and all kinds of stuff off the companion star. And that's why we know it's there. OK. Now, this is all indirect evidence for black holes, which as astronomers, we're very happy with. There's no other way that we can think of to really explain what's going on on Cygnus X1 or M87 other than there being a black hole. But as astronomers, we'd really like to detect the black holes directly. We'd, we'd really like to observe the black holes directly. And as it turns out, you and I live in the future and we can do this, okay? So Einstein, right after he thought of all of general relativity, he had the notion that perhaps if you have two black holes orbiting each other, as you can see in this movie, they would change the structure of gravity around them in a continuous way. And that change in gravity would propagate out into the universe. Okay, we call those changes in gravity gravitational waves. Okay, and Einstein spent the last 50 years of his life, and indeed the entire physics community spent the last 50 years of his life, being confused about whether or not we were sure they existed or they didn't exist. OK, that took a long time for physicists to work out. It was resolved in 1957 at a very uh, famous conference called the Chapel Hill Conference. And after that discovery that we convinced ourselves they exist, it took an additional 50 years for us to be able to detect them. OK, so gravitational wave astronomy is a thing now. We have successfully detected these waves. But Einstein himself famously thought we would never be able to detect them. OK, he had done the calculation of how strong these waves would be, and he was convinced that we would never be able to surmount the technical challenges we need to surmount in order to be able to measure these gravitational waves. OK, but as I said a moment ago, you and I live in the future. We have technology that comes from a lot of the discoveries Einstein made that he didn't have. We have lasers, we have supercomputers, we have optical materials, we have all kinds of technology at our disposal that allows us to build an instrument capable 
of detecting these gravitational waves that I just told you about. And indeed, we did do that on September the 14th, 2015. Uh, our LIGO detectors that we have, uh, one's in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, and one is in Hanford, Washington, detected two black holes spiraling around one another. So there's nothing that's emitting light at all. They were spiraling around one another, throwing these waves of gravity out into the cosmos. One was 29 times the mass of the sun. One was 36 times the mass of the sun. And they merged to form a new single black hole that was 62 times the mass of the sun. This is a uh, computer generated movie showing what you would see if you were close to those black holes. The distortion that you see here is of the stars behind the black holes. The light is in that funhouse way that we described with the event horizon telescope picture is being bent around the black holes while you're sitting here watching them slowly spiral together. Okay, that final 62 solar mass black hole is about 227 miles across. So if we laid it down on the state of Illinois, it would stretch all the way from the Indiana border all the way to the Iowa and Missouri border. Okay, so this is a big, big black hole. And that was just the first one we detected. Okay, so in the ensuing years since, we have cataloged some 90, almost 100, 97, I think, individual black hole events. So these are all of our black holes that we've detected. Okay, these red ones, okay, are the ones that we knew about before LIGO started measuring black holes. Okay, but all of these blue ones are new black holes that we've discovered just in the last eight years or so. Okay, so you are living right now through a renaissance in uh, black hole discovery and black hole astronomy. We are gathering all kinds of data that we never had before. We're seeing lots and lots of different examples. We're measuring black holes in exquisite detail um, and being able to measure their properties in a way that we never have before. Okay, now I also work on a mission called LISA. So this is the goal is to build a trio of spacecraft. Okay, so this will start happening in about a year or two. We'll start building them. Uh, they will be launched into space. The distance between any two of these spacecraft is two and a half million kilometers. So it's much bigger than the separation even between the Earth and the moon. Okay, it's going to follow the Earth and the moon around in its orbit and we will be able to detect gravitational waves in space just the same way that we do uh, here on Earth. The difference is the things we see in space will be uh, things like those giant black holes that we were talking about in the centers of galaxies. We will be uh, sensitive to things like all the dead stars in the Milky Way, not just tiny black holes there the size of the state of Illinois. OK, so we're very excited about this. And when I come back and give you a talk in 10 years, uh, I'll tell you all about the great discoveries that we make with Lisa. OK. OK, so that's all I'm going to say. Um, I do like to always leave you with a few things to go learning and reading on your own. Uh, there are a bazillion books and videos and resources and things out there uh, on black holes. Um, my my guitar teacher just told me there was a great uh uh, a great uh, documentary on Netflix about black holes, uh, so you can go watch that. Uh, but if you want to read books, Catherine and the folks at Mount Prospect uh, can help you. Uh, this book right here, Black Holes and Time Warps by Kip Thorne. Uh, Kip's one of the people who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of gravitational waves. Uh, this book won a science writing award, and uh, there's a lot in here about black holes, wormholes, gravitational waves, all that sort of stuff. Uh, this is a really fantastic book by Marsha Bartusiak. Marsha is an excellent uh, public science writer. She also won an award for this book. Uh, and this is all about the building of LIGO and the discovery of the first gravitational waves. Okay, there are two editions of this book. So if you get the second edition, there's an extra chapter in the end there about the discovery of gravitational waves. Okay. Uh, and then lastly, this book is for those of you who want a little more technical challenge. This is actually kind of a textbook. It's called Exploring Black Holes by Ed Taylor and John Wheeler. If you know just a little bit of algebra and just a smidge of calculus, you don't need too much. He kind of walks you through how to do some calculations about the extreme gravity of black holes yourself. 
Okay. So if you like, you know, doing algebra on the weekends instead of raking leaves and mowing the grass, then this is the book for you. Okay. Uh, there's a link to my blog. Uh, and then this link here is to uh, a, a large sequence that I did um, specifically about the development of general relativity uh, leading to black holes and gravitational waves that I did for the 100 year anniversary of general relativity. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say. I will say thank you so much for your time, and I will uh, go ahead and uh, turn it over to Catherine, and I'm happy to take questions for as long as folks would like to chat. Thank you so much, Shane. That was very informative. Lots of information to digest. Um, yes, we your have... brain should be melting at this point, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> um, we actually, that, that leads us into our first question. Um, patron said that they're having difficulty understanding that black holes have no actual physical surface. Can you explain that a bit further? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so actually, let me go back to uh, a picture here uh let's uh let's go to this one okay so so this is the kind of typical picture that you see of black holes you see stuff in the universe and then you see this is why we call it a black hole this black thing here in the center okay and so the question is what is it if there's no surface what do i mean okay so the event horizon the quote unquote surface of the black hole is just like the door to your room OK, if you open up the door to your bedroom, OK, the door is open, but there's a boundary. And on one side is your bedroom and on the other side is the hallway. And it's only when you step through that boundary that you're in your bedroom. OK, but there was nothing physical there. It's just a hole in space. And on one side, you're in your bedroom and on one side, you're in your hallway. OK, the surface of a black hole, the event horizon is the same way. There's nothing that's keeping you from being on one side of the event horizon except you taking that final step. And on this side, on the hallway side of the event horizon, the gravity is very strong. But if you can travel really fast, you can get away from the black hole. But the moment you step across the threshold through the event horizon into the bedroom side of the black hole, the gravity is so strong that you have to travel faster than the speed of light to get away. And we know nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So you can't get away. Okay, so we talk about that event horizon in the same way as that threshold to your bedroom. There's nothing there, but you can step through it and you're inside. Does that help? Um, next question. Uh, patron's son wants to know, can black holes suck up anything? Ah, yes. So this is a great question, right? The kind of picture we have in our heads is that black holes are little hoovers that run around the universe sucking everything up. And indeed, when you get close to a black hole, their gravity is very, very strong, right? As we just said, if your gravity was, was you know, um, uh, if you were right up against the black hole, the gravity is almost so strong that you can't get away. You have to travel close to the speed of light to get away, okay? But this picture that I showed you earlier is really the point, okay? Which is the sun, if you were close to the sun, you can feel the sun's gravity and it's making orbits around it. OK, but if I were to replace the sun with a black hole, OK, far away from the black hole, I can't tell the difference, right? The gravity out in the orbit where the Earth is, where any of the planets is, is really identical to the gravity that the sun had. But the black hole, a black hole, the mass of the sun is tiny. It's only two kilometers across or so, OK, whereas the real sun is something like 700,000 kilometers across. So if you could get down near the black hole, its gravity is very extreme because it's been shrunk down to this very tiny, tiny size that's only a couple of kilometers across. But as far as the Earth's concerned, right, we're still eight light minutes away from it. All that extreme gravity that happens near the surface of the black hole, we can't tell the difference of far, far away. So in that sense, black holes don't suck everything up. It's only when things get very close to them that the gravitational effects become extreme. But far away, you can't tell the difference at all. OK. Next question. Um, 
So light does not have mass, so it does not interact with the gravitational field. Since light travels through the electromagnetic field, would it be logical to assume that the electromagnetic, electromagnetic field collapses near the black hole, therefore even light cannot escape? So, so that's a little, that's not, I think, the way physicists think about this. So, so light, light, light is not massive. That is a correct statement. We think the photon is massless, as we say. Okay. But light does have energy. And one of the things that Einstein taught us about gravity is that all things feel the gravitational force, whether they have energy or mass. Mass and energy are equivalent. And that's why when you look at uh, like M87, you can see that the photons have bent in their journey around the black hole. The photon was trying to travel in a straight line, but it can feel the gravity of the black hole. And so the black hole is trying to pull the photon into it. And so its trajectory bends. OK, that's you're right. The photon doesn't have mass, but the photon has energy. And that's why it's being responsive to the gravitational field. Now, what happens to a photon as it falls into a black hole is uh, is exactly the same sorts of things that happens to a, a planet or a star when it falls into a black hole. The black hole tries to spaghettify it. OK, and, and the way it becomes spaghettified is that Photons, as they travel towards a black hole, their wavelength, the wavelength of that electromagnetic field, gets compressed or blue shifted, as we say. And if they try and travel away from the black hole, the gravity of the black hole stretches that photon out and they become red shifted. So the electromagnetic field absolutely is affected by the black hole and what happens deep down in the center um, as, as the photons fall towards the singularity is as much a mystery as what happens to mass when it falls towards the singularity. Okay. Um, this question is also talking about the physicality of, of black holes. Um, okay. Paige is asking, um, but doesn't mass mean that the black hole is collecting material and therefore has a physical element? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that's that's exactly where in the mystery lies, right? The, the idea that black holes form from mass, the explosion of the star and the collapse of their cores, would, would seem to insinuate, to argue that, yes, there must be something physical deep down below the event horizon. Um, we can measure the properties of that stuff, what you and I call mass, with orbits, the way I've drawn right here. But the question still remains, what happens to all that stuff that went into the black hole? And if we carry the laws of physics as we understand them as far as we are able, it seems that all of that material gets compressed into a very, very tiny space, into a space that's so small that the laws of physics, as you and I understand them, don't really apply. The classical laws of physics, general relativity, break down. And so the kind of forefront of research in gravity right now, one of the fronts of research, is to understand gravity on the most microscopic scales, what we call quantum gravity, in an effort to understand exactly this question, what happens to all that material when it gets compressed into that singularity? Now, there are hints about this. Those of you who have read, uh, there's a couple of famous books. There's a famous one called Black Hole Wars by Lenny Susskind, I think, uh, where Lenny talks about the arguments that he and Hawking and various other people in the field have had for decades about this question exactly, right? There is information about the universe, mass, quantum numbers, charges, atomic structures, whatever you want it to be, that disappears in, into the black hole. And the idea that, that that information vanishes somehow or is lost is very difficult for physicists to comprehend. So, um, so that's the part of this we don't understand, but it's deep down inside the black hole where we, we can't gather data from. So we're confined to trying to think of clever ways how we can understand that from the outside. Okay. Next question, would the presence of a black hole uh, eventually affect the earth and its location and uh, pull the earth towards the black hole? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so right now, there are no known black holes that will come close enough to the sun or the earth uh, to, to, to cause trouble, right? But, right, 
it's 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 not impossible to imagine that there are black holes wandering through the galaxy that, and of course you can't see them because they don't emit light, right, that may come close to a planetary system and it would cause a disruption if it did. Um, if you want to go to the extreme far future, okay, the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy are actually on a collision course with each other, okay? And at the center of the Milky Way is its giant black hole, and at the center of the Andromeda galaxy is its giant black hole, and three and a half billion years from now, the two galaxies will collide. And when that happens, the sun's orbit around the center of the Milky Way will be disrupted. And numerical simulations that have been done, some of them suggest that we'll, we'll start plunging in and out uh, through the center of the galaxy like, uh, like a yo-yo. Not the exact center, we're not gonna hit the black hole, but we're gonna be on a different orbit than we are now. So, so in that sense, you know, our, our ultimate future is going to be affected by a black hole. It's the, the black hole of Andromeda and the black hole of the Milky Way uh, bringing their galaxies together and colliding. But, but right now, there are none that we know of that are on their way to Earth. Next question. Could black holes actually be sucking mass and energy into another universe? Yeah, so that's a great question. So, you know, we talked about the black hole right at the beginning, the movie The Black Hole. And one of the one of the things about this movie is that the black hole was a tunnel to somewhere else. And indeed, that's a little bit of the uh, lore of black holes that's intriguing and plausibly true. If we sit down and we mathematically write out the complete description of a black hole in general relativity, one for certain kinds of black holes, black holes that are spinning or black holes that have electric charge, then it is possible there is a tunnel, a pathway through the black hole. You go into the black hole on our side and it emerges on the other side in something that, that we call a white hole. Okay, And so physicists debate if the white holes exist, where do they come out and what do they look like? And the two possibilities, of, well, there are three possibilities. The one possibility is somehow the black hole closes off the tunnel inside and there are no tunnels, okay? That's entirely possible and we can't get in to find out, but it's entirely possible that's true. Another possibility is the white holes do exist and they come out in another universe, as you just said. And the third possibility is the white holes do exist and they come out somewhere else in our universe. OK, and it's that last one that as an astronomer is really intriguing, because if they come out in our universe, we should be able to see them. OK, and so we look all over the sky all the time and we have not seen anything definitively that we would say, oh, my gosh, that's that's definitely a white hole over there. OK, but as astronomers, we look and someday we may find them. OK, but but mathematically, yes, there could be tunnels. I think most theoretical physicists, my, my PhD advisor, this is something he worked on, think that the tunnels somehow will be closed off, uh, but maybe not closed off completely. Maybe you could still squeeze through somehow, who knows, um, but, but it is definitely a possibility. And if you read that book by Kip, that Black Holes and Time Warps, I think he talks about the black hole tunnels in there. So, Speaking of the movie Black Hole by Disney, do you have any other favorite sci-fi movies about black holes <laughs> so so the the classic uh the 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 classic good black hole movie is interstellar by christopher nolan uh and so uh if you go watch interstellar uh kip thorne whose book i just pointed you out was the science advisor on that and there's a great uh companion book to interstellar called the science of interstellar that kip wrote and in there he talks about the big black hole and one of the great things about the black hole in there is they show what the effects of the black hole's gravity would be if you happen to be on the planet that was close to it and so they get a lot of that science just spot on uh because they they put a lot of effort into making sure it was it was it was good uh but kip's book goes through all of that one of the things i like about that science of interstellar book is each little bit of science in the movie he talks about he puts his own personal rating as a professional scientist for how well he thinks we got the science right or how well we think we understand the science and so it's kind of cool to read from that from that perspective but uh interstellar is is probably the other great one besides uh besides this one going back to talking about um the milky way and the andromeda galaxies colliding would this would our sun explode before those galaxies merge 
Yeah, that's a great question. So, so the sun is about halfway through its life. It's about uh, uh, 5 billion years old. It is expected to live about 10 billion years. So by the time the galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way collide, the sun will be well on its way towards old age. Um, the sun is not big enough that it will explode. It's actually going to, it'll swell up to become a red giant, but instead of exploding after that, it's going to collapse to something called a white dwarf, which is another type of stellar skeleton. But uh, that stellar skeleton doesn't explode. It's about the size of the earth and it's it's the most common end fate for stars. But, but the sun will be well on its way to that stage by the time the galaxies uh, collide. That actually answers our next question as well. Um, so I'm just going to look to see if there are any other questions, if anyone, oh, yes, something came in. OK. Um, when we send up a bunch of stuff into space and parts drop off, break off, um, or are left there as space junk, what happens to all of it? Will it eventually float around and eventually reach <coughs> a black hole or collide with other things and burn up? Um, yeah. This patient's worried about humans trash floating in space. Yeah, that's that's a great question. So so this is actually a problem. So so let's so let's do a couple of things. So first of all, it's very hard for us to get things away from the Earth's gravity. So most of the stuff that we send up is really just trapped here around the Earth. There is some stuff that we've sent out, but there's only five things that have so far left our solar system. And that's Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, and New Horizons, which is the spaceship that went to Pluto. Okay, those are the only five objects who's, who's traveling fast enough they can get away from the sun and are traveling out into the galaxy. Okay, but your question about stuff in space is anything we throw up into orbit, it stays in orbit. Some of it comes back down. And in fact, it's a big problem. We are very um, cognizant of the fact that we need to control some of it that comes back down. So for instance, one of these days, Hubble is going to die. And when Hubble does die, it will eventually collapse on Earth. And we don't want it to come down in any, some kind of uncontrolled way and you know, land on Cleveland. Okay, So there is a plan to fly a robotic rocket to it hook it onto Hubble and bring it back down to Earth and crash it into the Pacific Ocean, okay? So that it doesn't land on Cleveland, okay? But lots of stuff will just stay up there, okay? And indeed, there's all kinds of stuff in orbit. And this uh, space junk is kind of a problem. It ranges from spent pieces of rockets to paint flecks, okay? And so there has been a little bit of work done. And in fact, there is concern that the proliferation of material in Earth orbit could make it extremely difficult and dangerous. And you could imagine if it goes uncontrolled, impossible for us to fly through, right? We could put so much junk in orbit that it's impossible for us to leave Earth and go to the moon or go to Mars because we have to fly through the cloud of junk. Okay, so this is something that scientists are starting to think about and be very cognizant of. And as of right now, there are no strong international agreements for controlling it. Um, but it is something that we do need to work on uh, and it's only gonna get worse with time. Okay. Yeah. Um... <laughs> They said that's sad. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, work on it. Write a letter to your congressperson. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Looking for any other questions. Just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. Let's see here. If anyone's furiously typing away your question, it's totally okay. I'm just going to wait a couple more seconds just to be sure. Okay, doesn't look like anything else is coming through. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, wait, one moment. Oh, patron is asking if we'll, they'll, you'll have access to the presentation. This presentation is being recorded and we'll put on the library's YouTube page. If you just Google Mount Prospect Public Library YouTube, um, there's playlists for all our library programs. It usually takes us um, a couple days to get up there, um, but you can access the recording um, later. And it will be up indefinitely, so there's there's no need or rush to to go look at it before it gets taken down. 
Um, looks like that is the last question. So I want to thank okay. um, Shane so much for being here with uh, your awesome presentation. I learned a lot and I probably am also still confused about some things, but that's why we can go back and rewatch the, the recording. Um, and I want to thank everyone for all of your your questions. It's it's always so great when we see um, so many questions come in. So thank you so much for those. Um, yeah, I hope everyone has a, a good evening and thank you for coming. Hey, thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Bye.